Thank you, Rock, and thank you, Jeff, for having me, and thank you all for attending me. It's uh, great to be back in the again. Um, and I'm so happy to be here today to tell you about uh, what what we've been doing uh, in the field of quantum computing. Uh, it's, it's been a very exciting field, and um, I want to especially uh, convey what, what kind of benefits that it can confer to uh, time itself. So, like uh, many things, um, the Nobel Prize winning Richard Feynman is generally credited with coming up with the idea of uh, quantum computing. And he was relating this uh, to the fact that he was having trouble doing classical simulations of nature, meaning of atomic interactions, of how molecules work. Uh, it just wasn't mapping very well to the classical systems for reasons that I'll try to make clear later. So he said, if you want a computer that can calculate the way nature behaves, you better make it quantum mechanical. Because that's how nature begins. So, in uh, very simple terms, the difference between a classical computer and a quantum computer is a classical computer consists of bits of 0 and 1 of the binary that you're so familiar with, I'm sure. Um, but a quantum bit can take a logical state of not just 0 or 1, but it can take any superposition of that. Uh, so you can think about the 0 and 1 being at uh, the opposite end of an arrow. Uh, zero up there and one here. Um, but if you have a quantum bit, we can represent any arbitrary position of that zero and one at the surface of a uh, sphere. So we can think of this as the Earth, with zero at the North Pole, one at the South Pole, and then any, uh, any position on the equator, for example, would be an equal superposition of uh, both zero and one. And um, in general, these reflect probabilities, uh, but they're more generalized. They're called probability amplitudes negative complex, and it's these kinds of uh, probability amplitudes that gives quantum computers power. So, as a basic example of, of what quantum computers can do, um, right now you can take a very relatively simple molecule such as caffeine, one where you can count about 20 atoms or so, and uh, you can ask a classical computer, you know, the most powerful supercomputer on Earth, will never have a chance of understanding how this molecule works. It's just too complicated. And the reason it's too complicated is because each time you add uh, electronic orbital to this molecule, you have to concern yourself with the interactions with all the other nuclei and all the other electronic orbitals that have already existed in this molecule. So uh, in that way, the scaling of modeling these kinds of molecules does not go very well with uh, classical computer. However, if we had, uh, if we had perfect qubits, which we do not, um, we, could be, we would be able to model uh, this molecule using just 106 computers. That's a relatively small quantum computer, you might say, tackling a problem that is intractable by classical computers. And so how does uh, the quantum computer do that? Well, it uses the principles of quantum mechanics in order to form a very uh, an exponentially large computational space. So I mentioned superposition already, that you can take arbitrary combinations of 0 and 1. Well, you can do other things such as entangle these qubits with each other. And uh, by entangled, I mean these qubits then will possess a quantum state where they cannot be described independently of each other. Uh, and that opens up um, what we call a Hilbert space, where you have n qubits, you could have two to the n states. So the uh, space of computation is exponentially large. Uh, however, we also have um, problems with, um, or problems, but one of the features of quantum mechanics is when you measure the system, you collapse the state back into a classical zero or one. So in order to do computations, you have to take classical information, put it into your exponentially large computational space, and then somehow, uh, when you measure it, you want to extract the answer that you're looking for, which is just going to be one of those classical states. Now, uh, physicists often use this, this sphere uh, analogy I use, uh, we call it the block sphere, and we like to represent our operations by uh, rotations on that sphere. So as electrical engineers, you're familiar with your classical logic gates. Um, here we can put the demand gate or adding. What we would uh, consider instead is, uh, say, a knot gate, um, where we would take 0 to 1 and 1 to 0. We would consider that to be a 180-degree rotation around the x-axis, for example. Uh, and that's how we think about all of our operations, which we, we also call gates, not to be confusing with the logical ones. From classical electrical engineering. Um, the way we actually get the answer out uh, to 
maximize the answer uh, into something that we can read out possibly, is we have to use the, uh, the wave nature of quantum mechanics to, to interfere and classically, uh, classically uh, sorry, uh, constructively interfere the correct answer while deconstructively interfering with the correct answer that we do not want. So returning to, uh, to the simulation of molecules, we can uh, consider some, some pretty simple molecules and look at it, look to see what kinds of computational resources that we expect to uh, we, we expect to need to, to uh, understand the uh, inner energy states of the molecule. So, for example, for water, you're already at 10,000 bits, uh, whereas you only need 14 qubits. Uh, but what's important about this is they tend to the 48 bits, uh, classical bits needed for the simulation of caffeine. That's about the number of atoms that are on Earth. Um, but that's only 160 qubits. And you can see as you get more and more complex, it's just this scaling is going exponentially. So you, you can't even fathomly think of building any computer that would uh, that would run on any kind of limited resource to tackle any kind of these chemical problems. So these are just intractable by classical computers. However, you can see the scaling is very uh, tractable for quantum computers, being uh, something uh, it's polynomial, I think it's uh, to the third or fourth power of the number of orbitals in the state. So it, it doesn't uh, it doesn't grow out of hand exponentially like the resources you need for uh, classical computing. So in general, there are a lot of classes of problems that our computer science friends we call complexity theorists are the people that kind of under understand what kind of uh, computing resources you need in order to solve certain kinds of problems. So we kind of call the easy problems uh, like addition, subtraction, multiplication, most tasks that you are using your computer for, um, they're easy for both quantum systems and, uh, and uh, classical systems. But then we know that there are hard problems, such as the um, incomplete problems, which quantum computers can't necessarily tackle, uh, but it can do some of them. So, what are the things that got, uh, got um, uh, what are the things that got quantum people excited about quantum computing? That is algorithms like factory. Uh, Shor's algorithm will be known to break hard to encryption because it shows that quantum computers can uh, feasibly factor, but theoretically proven, you can factor any arbitrary number in a linear number of uh, qubits. Um, we also uh, are encouraged because while that requires essentially a fault tolerant error correct quantum computing, the noisy systems that we have right now, we have some theoretical evidence that we can do better than classical computers uh, with the noisy systems currently available. Um, as far as our other applications, we have a lot of uh, things based on hybrid classical quantum algorithms that are kind of on the border, which we think are going to be uh, hard for classical computers to perform, but that are quantum possible, uh, which I'll describe a little bit later. And then we know that simulating quantum mechanics is outside the realm of even hard problems for classical computers because it cannot be verified by a classical computer either. So, uh, what does a quantum uh, what does a quantum bit look like? Um, this is one of my Kind of favorite approaches to talking about quantum computing because it has to do with the physics of information. And this was a uh, this was a topic of research by IBMers uh, in the lab that I worked in in the 80s uh, by Rolf Landau or Charles, uh, Charles Bennett. Charles Bennett is still with us. Um, but they were considering the physical limits of information. What is the thermodynamics? What is reversible computing? Back when people were worried about the power consumption of computers today. So one of the things that they realized is that information is always coupled with the system that you store it in. So we may abstractly think of uh, as, as uh, zeros and ones as being uh, abstract mathematical things, but it always is physically represented by the state of the switch, perhaps, or the current that flows or doesn't flow through a transistor, or the polarity of the little tiny magnets in your hard drive. And all of these logical states go back to being either the yellow ball being zero or the, or the blue ball being one. Those are the only two things that that can represent. However, what if you started encoding information in systems that obey quantum mechanics, such as the ground or electric or ground or excited state of an atom, uh, to spin up or spin down an electron, or perhaps uh, what we like to use, like the superconducting circuits. Uh, in that case, we get back to our block sphere representation, where we have all these uh, powers of quantum mechanics uh, that we can use to uh, operate on and, um, and perform computation. Uh, so what does one of these things look like uh, that we use? So this is a five qubit uh, quantum computer. Actually, this is the first quantum computer we put on the cloud. 
And uh, uh, what it is is uh, essentially it's a, it's, a, it's a silicon substrate. It's patterned by standard CMOS techniques. In fact, it's a lot easier to make than CMOS. It consists of uh, superconducting metals such as niobium and aluminum, below which uh, they're operated at temperatures at which those metals become superconductors. If we zoom in on a little on this a little bit, we see the qubits are actually these kinds of um, they're in they're in the squares, um, and they look like a equal sign turned 90 degrees. And that equal sign actually is just a capacitor, that simple. Um, and they're connected by these, uh, these squiggly lines, which are microwave resonators. Um, one of the magical things about superconducting qubits is that what's between the capacitor essentially is a unique element called a Grossman junction, consisting of a superconductor insulator, superconductor sandwich, and that acts as a nonlinear inductor. And that's very important. Um, that's kind of the key behind all of this. The microwave resonators, on the other hand, we use them to couple the qubits together, to couple the qubits to the environment. Uh, they are distinct from the qubits, so they suppress noise from uh, they, 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 they prevent noise from getting to the qubits, as well as preventing the qubits from leaking out to the environment. So they act as a filter in a certain way. Um, the difference between those two is that the qubits themselves. Um, they're an LC oscillator, but the L is uh, nonlinear, so we, we call it, you probably know, an anharmonic oscillator. And that means that the energy level states are not going to be the same between right, each one. So we confine ourselves to the ground state and the first excited state, and label those to zero and one state. And that energy difference, that energy transition differs from that, from that, from the one to two state. So that means we can isolate these, one, uh, these zero and one and use those for computing. Whereas if you have the uh, LC oscillator where this is linear, then you have equal separation between all of your energy states. And you can't, well, there are ways you can do it, but uh, you can't in general address your qubits then by, by looking at uh, that transition because they're, they're not uh, unique. Now, these transitions occur in the microwave regime. Uh, so microwave engineering is actually a very important aspect of quantum computing and superconducting qubits. And uh, typically, your qubits are going to be on about the order of 5 gigahertz or so. And if you take 5 gigahertz and, like a physicist like me, convert that to a temperature, you find that's about 240 millikelvin. Now, that's even less than the superconducting transition temperature of the metals we're using, but because that's already a very cold temperature and we're trying to keep, uh, uh, we're trying to keep our logical state in, in, a, uh, in an energy that's less than that, we need to be as cold essentially as possible. Which brings us to IBM Q System 1. So, this is kind of a marvel of the last, uh, not, not the last quantum computer in the cloud, but definitely the most beautiful. Um, what we have here is we have a completely integrated system that kind of does the refrigeration, essentially does uh, cylindrical parts, but also is integrated with all of the cryogenics uh, that are necessary to get to low temperatures, as well as all the control electronics. Uh, and it's put into this beautiful glass box that is designed by the Kikion company. So um, I'm a hardware guy, so I would like to look under the hood and show you a little bit about what's going on here. So looking from the side and kind of splitting away from the view, you can see these inside of the uh, dilution refrigerator. So all of these things form a series of uh, a series of plates that are in, 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 in the order of decreasing temperature for the polar state of the bottom one. And that's where we put all the qubits inside the shielding down here with microwave components that route the signals around. So all these microwave components, the input lines, the output lines, are well thermalized to each one of their stages. We have uh, uh, quantum limited amplifiers and high electron mobility transistor amplifiers inside of the fridge. And this is all uh, integrated there. And all these parts are either to route microwave signals around and amplify or attenuate them, or to, uh, to actually do the cooling of this refrigerator itself. And then within this box as well is the uh, integrated FPGA-based waveform generation that is coupled with very stable RF sources and uh, digitizers in order to uh, beat out the state. Uh, so going a little bit deeper into what's in the box, this is kind of the world I live in, uh, we have these quantum limited amplifiers, which you, you can't go to the store and buy these things. These are still, uh, this is still a field of very active research. These are amplifiers that operate around the 7 gigahertz range, and they operate in the regime where they have the minimum amount of noise allowed by quantum mechanics, which is uh, half a photon at the read-out frequency. 
while giving you a good amount of gain, such as like uh, 20 dB or so. These, uh, these things are typically uh, parametric devices, and we have two kinds here. Uh, one of them that's, that's being researched by uh, MIT Lincoln Lab is uh, the traveling wave parametric amplifier. It uses a nonlinear dispersive medium in which to achieve the amplification. And the one we kind of prefer to IBM is the uh, Josephson parametric converter. And this uses the same kind of Josephson junction technology as the qubits, but in order to do a three-way mixing process instead of uh, um, uh, instead of uh, acting as a qubit, it performs the amplification using that nonlinear area. And this is also being researched by the university as well. Um, and then, uh, of course, we need to protect the qubit by as much as it is possible. For, so, for example, the qubits are packed inside the circuit board where wire bonds are made to the circuit itself and to transition lines inside that, uh, inside that front circuit board and then the signals go to uh, coax cables. So that's how the signals come in and out. But then cryogenically, they need to be mounted by something that's attached to the state of the refrigerator, and it needs to be shielded. So this is a cryoperm fan, which is uh, shielded from magnetic fields, and we have uh, also echo material, which prevents infrared radiation from leaking into, uh, into the device and uh, bothering the humans. So um, that's all I for hardware, but I'll be happy to talk to you. anyone later about this. I'm going to kind of go into the, the era which we're in, which is... Uh, uh, we call the NIST era, and this refers to noisy intermediate scale quantum technology. And it's the area we're in right now where our qubits are not perfect because we are not performing error correction on them right now. Not that we don't want to, we don't have enough qubits and we don't have low enough error rates to, in order to be able to do this. Uh, so what I want to first tell you about is the kind of metrics that we're looking at in the near term while we're in this noisy era of quantum computers before we can get to the quantum so there's many kinds of errors that, that uh, we, we measure in the lab, and these are kind of the device level characteristics that experiments with like me are, are performing. Um, so for example, you could have control errors. I mentioned that uh, the gates are considered as uh, rotations around these broad spheres. And, uh, sometimes those rotations aren't going to be perfect, also uh, especially because uh, the quantum operations are continuous, whereas uh, classical operations are highly nonlinear, so if your voltage is a little off, you don't have to flip. But you do for a quantum computer, so if you have a little bit of an over-rotation, say by epsilon, that over-rotation is going to accumulate as you go on. Um, you can also have uh, other kinds of errors, say you want to confine yourself to zero in one state, but if you uh, want to make your pulses too short, um, you can generate a problem because in the Fourier constant of those pulses becomes too high and you accidentally excite some of your qubits in the higher order state to two level, which we refer to as features. And that is not good for uh, really the style of computing for a uh, We also have a lot, of, a lot of measurement errors. Even with those quantum limited amplifiers, we still have error rates on the order of 2 or 3 percent. And just the fact that we can measure these qubits with um, 97 or 98 percent certainty is pretty amazing. But there are still problems. And uh, a lot of times there's also interference events during those measurement errors so that your results are get classified incorrectly um, based on the. the Stops moving away from these to block the correct measurements. Um, there's also a crosstalk, and that, as you know, would be your trying to address one qubit and another qubit with affecting that, or being affected by it in an unintentional way. Um, and then there's a lot of the uh, kinds of inherently quantum uh, quantum problems that affect the length of time we call called the coherence time, uh, which is essentially how long does the information remain quantum. It, it does not stay quantum, it always goes away, and there's a number of reasons why this can happen. So, you can have a relaxation from the one from the one state to the zero state. That's, uh, that's common, and that can, be, uh, that can be an engineering problem, which is something I worked on. You can think of the circuit as being like a, having, a, having an LC time constant, and that affects the time, the lifetime of the information. You can also couple two defects that are material defects that exist on your, on your chip. Uh, that's probably one of the biggest sources of problems. We call them the two-level systems. And um, there's also different kinds of superconducting phenomena, such as quasi-particles and vortices, that can couple to and uh, do bad things to your qubits. And if your qubits are too uh, hot, then your zero state can be uh, also excited to your one state. So that would be called a uh, called thermal, thermal execution would be very bad because you always want to assume that you're in the initial position of the unit. And then there's a little bit more about uh, more quantum kinds of uh, incoherence 
this is where you have, uh, uh, say, fluctuations in energy levels caused by uh, thermal, uh, caused by thermal noise. You get uh, not uh, not well defined energy separation, and that uh, will change the frequency of the qubits. And if you change the frequency of the qubits, that causes unintentional key rotations in the block here. So you get this uh, this component called dephasing. Um, the same kind of thing happens when you measure measure. You actually dephase the qubit and collapse it onto the z-axis. Um, and then what we'll usually do is combine the relaxation with the phasing and call that an overall decoherent time. And we usually uh, call that C2, which we stole from the nuclear magnetic resonance. So, as we're trying to make all these metrics better in the lab, uh, in the short term, we're thinking about algorithms that will work on one computer. So that means I can do the algorithms I know quickly enough before the computer go here or with a few enough gates where my errors don't accumulate from the control, um, or we've actually been pioneering classical quantum, classical, uh, quantum hybrid algorithms. In the long term, all of the uh, all the algorithms you know, like George's algorithm, Grover's algorithm, algorithm for search, universal quantum simulation, those kinds of things will require uh, a universal fault tolerance quantum computer, and that's why we're working on quantum error correction as kind of an alternative path. So we're looking at one way we're trying to do something useful today with the noise that we have, and in the other direction we're working on quantum error correction in order to um, in order to look at the future for the algorithms that are theoretically proven to get um, So the next thing we uh, try and do is how do you uh, I've showed you all these kinds of uh, metrics that we're using before. What if we wanted to combine all of those into a single metric? And that is something we've done. We call it quantum volume, and uh, Kind of works like an old in, in a way because when you read about quantum computing, people give you count the number of qubits. Not that we're not guilty of that, also. But uh, uh, what matters probably more than the number of qubits is actually the error rate of those qubits, and that's what this quantum volume graph is intended to display. So the number of qubits is here on the right, and the error rate is here on the left. And as you can see, you can increase the number of qubits say from 50 to 100, but if you still have a 1% error rate then you're not improving the quantum volume at all. There's no way you can get entanglement across all those hundred qubits without, uh, with those kinds of error rates. So, alternatively, you could decrease the error rate by a factor of 10, and that would actually allow you to do a lot more with those qubits you have. So, what we're, what we're actually trying to do is we're trying to decrease the error rate, and in general, increase the number of qubits. Those are, you know, not always, they can be at odds with each other, and we have to work in both ways in order to, uh, that's the kind of kind we have. This was a um, mathematically stimulated, uh, simulated to be uh, kind of the quantum version of Mintech for high performance computing. And uh, what it is based on is what is the largest square array that I can, uh, a square circuit that I can do arbitrary quantum operations on. And, and by square, I mean you have an equal number of units of depth is equal to the number of units you have. And what these pies are right here to be a uh, permutation so that you can have random interactions between any pair of qubits, whereas the SQ4 represents any arbitrary two qubit uh, operation. So in, this is kind of uh, represents the most general thing you have, but of course, uh, when, you, uh, when you make these quantum devices, they're not all next to each other, like they have a, they have a layout that is part of the architecture that's fundamental at the device level. So, one of the reasons we like this metric is because it includes everything that you could possibly think of as far as uh, building a quantum computer goes. And I should uh, also note that because uh, the result of the simulation, uh, the result of the experiment has to be compared against the perfect outcome. This is only good for a certain, up to a certain number of qubits, but we think it's about 50, where the memory of a classical computer would run out and therefore we can no longer calculate what the arbitrary circuit should be. Uh, so this kind of takes all those uh, gate level metrics that I uh, showed you on the previous slide, and it has a few more that uh, I'll show you here. So our 53 qubit device has a coupling map, which means only certain qubits are coupled to each other. So some of them have two nearest neighbors, some of them have three nearest neighbors, and the way that you map your problem onto those qubits is going to be affected by uh, how how many times they have to swap the qubit information to do an arbitrary interaction between the qubits. Uh, and likewise, uh, there is software that comes into play because if you take your quantum circuit and you want to compile it down and map it to something like your qubit, 
you want to do that in a smart way because you have a certain company map that you that is your architecture that you're using. So this takes into account not just device level metrics that I showed before, but also everything or other things that you might want to consider as you build up the quantum architecture and uh, and software. Software is also very important. I'll be talking about that later. So um, of course we've compiled like a, a, a list of business use cases. Um, a lot of these kind of uh, as you can expect, have to do with chemistry because these model molecules and catalysts and help to get up to modeling drugs uh, and, and larger things. Um, but there's also uh, some of these uh, algorithms are very good for machine learning, for example. Um, we have uh, kinds of related to Grover's algorithm for search uh, or other Oracle-based uh, quantum algorithms for uh, optimization and uh, scenario simulation. And uh, in particular, I wanted to just point out some that I, I think were really good for uh, Ireland in general. And, and this is, of course, a chemistry example. Um, so as it, I know agriculture is one of the biggest uh, exports to Ireland. Uh, so I wanted to just say a little bit word about this uh, particular molecule. Um, so right now, uh, uh, right now, in order in order to uh, grow crops, you need fertilizer. And most of that fertilizer comes from a process called the Haber-Bosch process discovered about 100 years ago. And what that does is it takes nitrogen from the air, which is triple bonded together, it's very strong, and it converts it into ammonia, which is something useful that plants can. Uh, plants can eat, and it has uh, three single bonds to hydrogen. So, the haber bosch process has been wonderful for, uh, for humanity in general. In fact, it's thought that two-thirds of us on the planet who are only here because of this process, because otherwise we wouldn't have enough food to feed the world. So, as important process this is, it takes place at about 200 atmosphere and about 450 degrees Celsius, and is estimated to account for about 2% of the world's energy. Um, so not just from an efficiency standpoint, but also from a climate change standpoint, it would be really nice if we didn't have to spend all that energy. Well, we know there's a solution out there. There's a reaction that a bacteria uses called the nitrogenase reaction. It takes place at ambient room temperature and pressure, and at the core of this, uh, this reaction involves a protein that has something in it, which is a relatively simple molecule, I've pictured it right here, called the Pimico complex. And this uh, near term is one of the, uh, this would be a, one of the shiny lights for quantum simulation as for quantum computing, because if we can figure out how this molecule works, and we can develop catalysts based on this molecule in order to, uh, um, in order to uh, perform a nitrogen fixation at ambient room temperature and pressure, then we can save 2% of, uh, of the world's energy, as well as uh, be a boom for uh, agriculture industry as well. So that's one of my favorite things. Um, I also know that banking is a very large sector in Ireland, and uh, I wanted to say that we have uh, actively been performing uh, research on quantum risk analysis. So a lot of these uh, risk analysis uh, risk analysis classical algorithms use the Monte Carlo sampling because the basic computation is too large. And we have proven, uh, these are IBM researchers in Zurich, uh, we, have, we have shown that you can get at least a quadratic increase in performance with a quantum computer, and we have um, implemented some cases for that. Uh, and we've done some of that research with uh, J.P. Morgan Chase, actually. Uh, and there, there are some, some other, uh, other ones that I think uh, might, might be more particularly important to electrical engineers, such as uh, power, uh, Providing power, for example. So, one of the goals of physicists and electrical engineers over the over the last few decades is uh, high temperature superconductors for lossless power transmission. That would be something that, because we don't understand, our less physicists didn't do a good job of figuring out how high temperature superconductors work. Maybe they could be elucidated by kinds of uh, material discovery simulations that I showed before. Um, and just to just to provide you a little bit of the um, the, the research that we've been doing is we've been developing algorithms. These algorithms uh, run on these noisy kinds of systems, these hybrid classical quantum algorithms that are really only about five years old. This is a very, very new area of research. So we've used this uh, algorithm that we call variation, variational quantum eigen solver uh, to perform case studies of some very simple molecules. Look at their um, energy versus log length so we can consider their, their equilibrium position. That gives us insight into their reaction pathways uh, and the way they, the way they want to interplay with other uh, molecules. So we can see we can do hydrogen you know, 
very well. And then we see we're not so good with uh, linking high drive back to our kind of slope. We have a little bit of a peak. Uh, really, in high drive, we're a little offset. And we know that these are due to uh, certain, certain aspects of the algorithm or the nature of the device, such as we're not running uh, long enough, uh, deep enough for hit for in high drive. We're not, uh, we don't have enough coherence time in order to simulate the really high drive. Well. So we're learning by doing this, and what, we, uh, what we've also tried, and this was uh, much more recently published, is uh, we, we considered running the lithium high drive deeper, and then um, trying to do some error mitigation, not correction, I said. We're looking at classical and quantum ways of getting rid of the errors that exist on our software now without doing full-blown error correction. Uh, so this is our way of, um, we know we have noise in the system. What we can do is actually amplify it by extending the length of the algorithm and uh, by then kind of bringing us back to the case of zero, uh, the limit of zero noise, we can actually improve the simulation uh, substantially where we can get right onto the uh, exactly calculated curve. Um, so this, this uh, error validation can be specifically what's called reproducible burning to the mean, but we have all kinds of other uh, error mitigations that we're thinking of. Towards classical, this is the classical one, uh, and quantum error mitigation. Uh, so this is a very important uh, area for, for our field right now, and we feel that this is necessary for us to do anything useful in the near term, where every every uh, quantum operation is, is still pretty uh, error prone. Um, we have machine learning results in this year, um, so uh, you can consider us a support vector machine as, as a sort of uh, mathematical instrument that we do separation and classification of the system, such as by uh, squares the x component of this uh, of, of the line of, of the dot on the slide, you can separate with the hyperplane, the light blue and dark blue uh, circles, because uh, quantum uh, quantum operations are much more rich in their uh, their, their complexity because they exist in the entire dimensional space. We can actually do extremely well with a quantum version of the support definition where the future spaces of uh, the future spaces are defined by these quantum operations. We can actually be uh, very successful classification. And this is also something that's going on uh, noisy uh, short term devices. Uh, so I want to share with you so uh, a, a little bit of how some of these um, uh, how some of these quantum processes work, such as uh, interference, like how do I get corrected throughout. So I have all my all my answers uh so it's called interference uh, uh, the wave interference of course. Uh, so if I'm doing a quantum process, typically I'll end up with a, my answer, but it'll be encoded in a state where you have people in the probability of all the, the uh, of all the states occurring. But consider the fact that you can mark one of these, and in a way of marking it, you can flip the phase of it. Because these are probability amplitudes, and you can just multiply that by minus one, flip that to the other side. What that effect is it's done is drop the average of the amplitude down. And then what you can do is flip. Uh, that uh, flip all of them about that average. But the flip this one about the average and you can make the amplitude. So this is a thing called amplitude amplification. If you get Grover's algorithm, if you start with the algorithm, uh, and uh, I would say probably the other most famous one is the inverse monetary appearance one, but I'm not going to get into that. Uh, what I would much like to get into is what uh, we've been doing at IBM with regards to quantum computing. Um, and uh, we released the first quantum computing on the cloud over three and a half years ago. Currently, we have 10 systems on the one line on the cloud. And there are not many companies that have any quantum computers on the cloud. And uh, I'd like to just say we're pretty proud of these. Some of these you can use for free. You can go home today and you can register and you can start playing with one of these. Such as these guys right here. Um, some of these are for our client members of the Dimension Network. Uh, and we're very proud of this one we just put online. I've worked on this. Uh, this is a computer device. Which is um, located up at our uh, at our, um, our facilities in Kipsey, which is about an hour further north of Yorktown Heights, and is accessible by clients right now. Uh, so that's the hardware. Let's move on to uh, what we are doing with software. So I mentioned the uh, we put the first qubit on we put the first qubit online in 2016. We call that the IBM Two Experience, and uh, we are are looking at building a whole the whole software, the whole software stack, the whole ecosystem, everything that you need to do quantum computing, IBM is trying to do. So this team went online uh, back then, and 
we're up to over 180,000 users right now. So uh, it has been quite a resource for a lot of people, and uh, we're, we're very proud of the rapid adoption that it, it, it has seen. Uh, the first qubit was, uh, the first one was a 5 qubit device that I showed earlier, but we now have several 5 qubit devices and a 14 qubit device that are open to everyone. Um, we've also released an open source uh, framework for quantum computing called DISKIT. That stands for the Quantum Information Science Division. And um, it's on GitHub. You, you had over 275,000 downloads, so you can go home and clone that yourself today. Uh, and then we realized that, you know, not even every quantum researcher in the world has access to a quantum computer. It's only a handful of labs across the world that has that. So we have had over 200 peer-reviewed publications that were uh, performed with our hardware, but external to IBM researchers um, in the scientific literature since we put the quantum experience out. Um, and then we also kind of hit a milestone recently where the... Uh, access to the actual quantum computer was, was scarce compared to our simulators. You know, everyone has a simulator. All this uh, quantum computing is just getting certain new transportation. So uh, simulating this is, is something we, we use to uh, use for people to inform the actual institutions they run. But now we've gotten to the point where we actually have more execution on the quantum hardware than on the simulators itself. Uh, and I should also mention that this has been a great teaching tool for classes in quantum computing. We've been adopted at least by 1,500 university classrooms, and uh, we, we have professors that go home and get their students' assignments to say, go to the IBM quantum computer and do your homework. It's pretty amazing. Okay, so uh, what, what the IBM computer experience consists of, and I should say it's very nice now because we, we just recently revamped it, so we've tried to integrate it as much as possible. The circuit composer is where you actually put the actual, uh, the actual logic of data. Um, the, the catamars, the exploitation, the, the control knot, and all of the things uh, I didn't really mention earlier. But all the operations you need to do for, uh, for quantum computing, you can just drop those onto the, uh, onto the floor. I'll show a picture of that in a second. Uh, the KISKIT notebook, we, we, have written, um, we have written software in, uh, in uh, Python, so it's a very popular language with, uh, especially young people these days. I started learning it a few years ago. And uh, we have something called Jupyter Notebooks, which are just on the in your browser notebook that we've integrated into the system so that you can uh, do your computations just writing, by writing in Python. And in that same way, we extend the library to allow you to do more than just your basic uh, data operations uh, from the circuit composer. And we turn this into a seamless experience where all our you, you register under your username and all your work is saved every time circuit you build. Every line of Python you wrote is there waiting for you when you, uh, uh, when you rent. Also, every, every search, every simulation, or uh, actual hardware run, the results of that are also stored there, so you have access to all this quantum work that you've been doing. Um, so what this, what this uh, gives you is, uh, um, it's, it's the same for the open as it is for our, our, our premium access, which is our IBM client members. Uh, it will welcome you and it will tell you how uh, devices you have access to. These are some of the open devices that anyone can use and that can you. Uh, and we have some simulators here as well. And then uh, we, we have kind of advanced programming tools. So we have uh, tutorials. And, and uh, if you want to learn more about uh, quantum computing, I, I would highly recommend going through the history tutorial because we will explain the concepts behind quantum computing. And then we will help you demonstrate them by showing you the code that you need to write doing them on a simulator or on the actual quantum hardware. Um, and, and that goes up to the algorithms that we're putting out today. As soon as we put out a, a, a scientific publication, within weeks it's going to be, uh, there's going to be a tutorial uh, on it that you can learn from and execute yourself. Uh, the composer is this uh, is kind of game model where the circuits, because quantum information has to be reversible, and it has two lines to meet at once. So everything goes along the line, you have a register to this, and your operations are executed along the line. So, there's a hat of artists being on an expectation uh, So you can still program this, but that's mainly useful for the smaller quantum devices like the 5 qubit systems. You really want to move to uh, the Python code for, uh, for the higher number of systems. Uh, we also have an overview of what all these operations do. Um, you know, all of this is matrix algebra. We'll, we'll give you the matrices and we'll tell you how they're actually implemented um, in the hardware. Uh, and then programming. Uh, 
program that just had is, is put in here so you can start doing physics here. And this, for example, is for teleportation. This will show you how to teleport an arbitrary quantum state from one state to another. Uh, so it's a, it's a very big learning tool, and I, I really uh, I really recommend it if you're more interested in learning about quantum computing. Um, and for completeness, I just would like to go with the software stack. The, the way that we're trying to develop the software to run on our hardware so that it's most useful for um, for our clients, for the general public, for students, for researchers in general. Uh, we've made it open source so that anyone can download it, anyone can contribute to it. We have many, many non-IBM people that have contributed to this bit. Uh, it's written in Python 3, so it's, it's easy for uh, people to understand. Uh, it kind of consists of a bedrock, which is era. It's kind of a foundation where it will take you to this. It will compile them. It will transpile them. It will try to figure out the most efficient way of taking the quantum circuits you want to do and map it onto the quantum device. Uh, we also have uh, tools for characterizing and mitigating error. We call it MNIST. This is kind of a research level thing where we can do, uh, do pulse level. Uh, we have our open source, which allows you for pulse level, uh, pulse level input of waveforms. So, for example, we can start to think about optimal control theory and find that to the quantum theory. You can do the Richardson determines the mean. You can do dynamical decoupling. You can do kind of whatever you want to try and get rid of error. Uh, and we have simulators to help you along those lines so that you can uh, help you figure out if your uh, if your error mitigation works. To help you figure out where your sources of error are and to model them appropriately, uh, as well as for algorithm development. Uh, so the, the website itself looks like the IBM Quant experience. Uh, you can create notebooks or, or Start composing them using the um, So along the lines of um, uh, along the lines of building uh, the software, we need to uh, consider people who want to program that software. And you definitely realize that you can build a, as many quantum computers as you want, but if there's no one to develop software on them, then they're not going to be very useful. So we started building what we call the DISC community, or two community. And uh, we are available on all of the typical developer type websites like Slack, Medium, Facebook, YouTube, you know, GitHub. Um, it shows you all the uh, yeah, kind of all the ways you can you can advance the community, get coders excited, teach students, um, how to do everything. Uh, we have uh, uh, we have everything on GitHub. So we have Tiskit and we have development parts of the Tiskit that I mentioned in the software framework. So I have an intern who's working on one of the branches of AIR right now. So that means I need to learn it. Uh, we have a uh, we're, we're we're pushing the uh, open source community. So we have hackathons. We want to show people how to uh, how to program computers and get them you know excited and get them in the community. So this is a picture, for example, of uh, hackathon in Madrid. IBM is a global company, so we're doing this globally. Um, that was uh, from a few months ago. And then we also have Kids Kid Camps, which are kind of like immersive uh, quantum workshops plus a hackathon. Uh, this, this just started happening this year. I went to the first one in March. Uh, it was in Vermont, north of New York City. But um, since then, we've had them in uh, Switzerland. There's one going on outside Tokyo right now. Uh, there will be one in South Africa next month. So we are kind of all, all over the place. And uh, the people, the organizers, are, are really good and really friendly, and they always get really, really good locations. So if you have a chance to go to a Tiskit camp, I would really recommend it. Um, uh, so we have all kinds of worldwide events, uh, kind of a summary of all the things we do. We go places, uh, we talk about fun computing, we go to uh, universities to teach people about fun computing. And uh, uh, actually, I don't have it on the slide, but we all are also actually making it easier for educators to teach to use Tiskit for teaching their quantum computing class. Uh, we have a series of videos uh, on YouTube that are uh, uh, that teach you how to start using Tiskit. So, uh, fortunately, in front of it, it's just out of order. I'm just going to go out of order. Uh, we call it Tiskit for Educators, and so we'll have a, a summit where we bring university professors to our lab in Georgetown Heights. We'll go through the papers and we'll teach them how to use this. We'll give them ideas for things that they might want to do in their class. And uh, additionally, uh, I really recommend this video by my buddy Abe. He's very good at explaining things. And he has a series of videos called Coding with Tiskit. And 
it's on YouTube. So if you just look up uh, coding with his kit um, on YouTube, you can find it, and you can just follow step by step how this start actually is interested in things you can do with it. And the uh, um, because Dave is so good at explaining things, he's also been responsible for an open source textbook that we have online. So it's open source; anyone can download it, and anyone can contribute to it. And it's all about learning our uh, quantum computing with this kit. So it takes you step by step. Through the uh, through the states, through the algorithm, um, and, uh, and we're excited to continue going um, going on with it. And then I think I just wanted to say, uh, the slide was out of order. So, uh, the IBM Q network um, we established this maybe a, I think it was a couple of years ago, where we partner with a bunch of uh, industrial, academic, national labs, startups, uh, mainly like industry partners, like JP Morgan. For example, we worked on the risk analysis, the quantum risk analysis of uh, research with us. And that's where our researchers at IBM are closely working with researchers at these companies to uh, develop, um, so develop solutions for their problems, often publishing the results in the academic literature. Um, we have many hubs. Um, many of those are universities or national laboratories. And those hubs that have their own members or their own members of the IBM network that don't go to a hub. And so that kind of creates a community of uh, quantum researchers within specific regions of the U.S. or different countries, for example. And then um, here we have many members. We have been working with a lot of startups. Uh, so we're, we're very excited for all the ideas that startups have. For example, I know like Cambridge Quantum Computing, they uh, look at quantum resources, like I have this algorithm I want to run. What is it, what's the best way to put that up into classical uh, quantum computer with super definite quantum computer with ion gaps? Um, all these different kinds of ways you can solve your problems using the resources that are available. That that's how is a, is a, is a great uh, company that's working on these chemistry and machine learning kinds of algorithms. Uh, a lot of these are trying to bring quantum computing to businesses. Um, such as uh, IT, uh, Strange Works is working on quantum computing for IT and uh, CIO kinds of applications. Two controllers looking at post level control for getting rid of errors in your quantum computing. Uh, so there's a lot of uh, ideas out there, and I, what, what I noticed uh, earlier, this is funny because these are all software companies, but we actually just partnered with our first hardware company called Alpine Quantum Computing in Austria, and they are actually building a quantum computer with ion traps, the uh, competing technology to the computer. So we don't want to say we're not open to, uh, to them. And then, of course, we've been doing research with academia for a very long time. In fact, I've been collaborating with academia since I've been at IBM and quantum. Uh, six years ago, but not only providing access to uh, these universities for their researchers in, in, in academia, but we're also collaborating and doing projects with the students and their, and their principal investigators uh, in academia, and I'm involved in a number of those uh, myself. Uh, so it's a very exciting time that we, that we add, uh, add more members in both the community, and uh, i just like to say, I, I hear that uh, I hear that the Thai government is Start funding quantum computing uh, next year, which is very exciting. Uh, and I, I would like to go ahead and say that you know even without the money going in there, uh, IBM is doing our best to provide you with the resources for you to go out there and learn on your own and start thinking about the kinds of problems that you want to solve. Um, and uh, with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention. And I don't know if we have time for questions, but I think that I'll be around. I'd be happy to talk to you. Uh, to to you I want to hear more. Uh, thanks.